IELTS Practice Tests Plus by Vanessa Jakeman and Claire McDowell Published by Pearson Education Limited Cassette 1, Side 1 Skills for IELTS Listening Listen to extracts 1 and 2 and answer questions 1, 2 and 3 Extract 1 Good afternoon. Ticket office. Oh, hello. Can we still get tickets for tonight's performance of the concert? Yes, there are tickets still available. How much are they? Full price is $35 or $25 concession for students. $25 sounds OK. And what time does it start? Doors open at 6.30pm, but the concert doesn't begin until 715 Can I get two student concessions for this evening, then? and collect them at the door. Certainly. Do you have your student ID with you? Extract 2 Good morning. Can I come in? Yes, come on in. I'd like to enroll for an English course at this college. Can you tell me when the next course starts? Right. Well, the next intermediate English course begins on Monday the 10th of September. You could probably join that one. Otherwise, you'd have to wait until January or April. Mm. I think I'd like to do the next course, if possible. I'm going home in April. OK. Could you take a seat, and I'll get one of the teachers to have a word with you. Now listen to Extract 3 and answer the questions. Extract 3 Oh, good morning. I'm from Rex Research. We're a firm of market researchers and we're doing a survey on shopping choices. Would you mind answering a few quick questions? It won't take a minute. Oh, all right. Can you tell me whether you wash your hair every day, five times a week, three times a week, or less? Oh, um, usually every other day. OK, so let's say four times a week? Mm, yes, I suppose so. Do you always buy the same brand of shampoo? Um, I tend to buy a different one each time, I think. So, are you influenced by your budget, the shape of the bottle, or the publicity? Oh, I think I usually go for value for money. I don't take much notice of the advertising or what the bottle looks like. Right. Thank you for answering our questions. Uh, please accept this free sample with our compliments. Oh, thank you very much. Now listen to extract three again and answer questions seven and eight. Oh, good morning. I'm from Rex Research. We're a firm of market researchers and we're doing a survey on shopping choices. Would you mind answering a few quick questions? It won't take a minute. Oh, all right. Can you tell me whether you wash your hair every day, five times a week, three times a week, or less? Oh, um, usually every other day. OK, so let's say four times a week? Mm, yes, I suppose so. Do you always buy the same brand of shampoo? Um, I tend to buy a different one each time, I think. So are you influenced by your budget? the shape of the bottle, or the publicity. Oh, I think I usually go for value for money. I don't take much notice of the advertising or what the bottle looks like. Right. Thank you for answering our questions. Uh, please accept this free sample with our compliments. Oh, thank you very much. Listen to extract four. You'll hear four different mini-talks. In each case, identify the main idea. Sometimes this will be explicitly stated, sometimes it will be in the overall message. Extract 4 1. What I want to emphasise is the cost of the project. Since 1990, £43 million have been spent on the extension to the suburban train line. 2. If you want to get a distinction on this course, you're going to have to put the hard work in. And that means handing your assignments in on time, 
turning up for all the tutorials and doing well in the exams. 3. It's interesting how some people can be passionate about certain things while others have no interest in them at all. For instance, I have some friends who just love horses. They love to ride them, to breed them and race them. In fact, horses are their lives. Personally, I can't see the attraction. 4. It was amazing. We were sitting there on the plane in London, waiting for the other passengers to board, just about to take off, when I looked up, and who do you think was coming down the aisle? It was Mike, all the way from Melbourne. And as if that weren't strange enough, he had the seat next to me. I couldn't believe it. What a coincidence. Listen to extract four again and pause after each speaker. Make notes of some of the supporting information. One. What I want to emphasize is the cost of the project. Since 1990, 43 million pounds have been spent on the extension to the suburban train line. Two. If you want to get a distinction on this course, you're going to have to put the hard work in. And that means handing your assignments in on time, turning up for all the tutorials, and doing well in the exams. 3. It's interesting how some people can be passionate about certain things while others have no interest in them at all. For instance, I have some friends who just love horses. They love to ride them, to breed them, and race them. In fact, horses are their lives. Personally, I can't see the attraction. 4. It was amazing. We were sitting there on the plane in London, waiting for the other passengers to board, just about to take off, when I looked up, and who do you think was coming down the aisle? It was Mike, all the way from Melbourne. And as if that weren't strange enough, he had the seat next to me. I couldn't believe it. What a coincidence. Listen to extract five and answer the question. Extract five. Ladies, gentlemen and children, welcome to the Australian Museum. Great to see so many of you here this morning for the opening of our fantastic exhibition on spiders. As you know, we've got some particularly mean spiders in Australia, but most spiders are quite harmless and play an essential role in maintaining the balance of nature. One of our primary aims with this exhibition is to inform people about these wonderful little eight-legged creatures who work in harmony with mankind. Listen to extract six and answer the question. Extract six. Can you tell us about the new running shoes which you've developed for the Olympic athletes? Sure. Well, the shoes were designed by a team of researchers at the University of Calgary, where we've been looking at ways of increasing performance by reducing the damaging effects of vibrations on a runner's body. What's so special about them? Well, basically, they can boost the athlete's performance by up to 4%. The shoes are made of conventional materials, but by varying the elasticity of the sole, we believe the shoes can slice around four minutes off the time of a marathon runner, which is the difference between finishing first or 21st. Wow! They may also prove to be useful in helping elderly people to walk, but we're still working on this aspect of the shoe. Listen to extract seven and answer questions 11 to 14. Extract 7. Welcome to Portsmouth Naval Dockyard. We're standing next to what remains of King Henry VIII's ill-fated flagship, the Mary Rose. As you may know, the ship sank in July 1545, just off the coast of England, not far from here. The King himself apparently watched in horror from the shore. As the sea entered her gun ports, she tipped over and sank to the bottom, where she lay for more than 400 years. That's four centuries buried in the mud. In 1971, the wreck was rediscovered, but it wasn't until 1982 that the ship was raised. 
Since then, a massive research program has taken place to unravel the mystery of why she sank. One of the scientists is a tree ring specialist, and he's been studying the preserved timbers of the ship, and they now believe, after analysing the timbers, they have uncovered a vital clue as to why the ship sank. Listen to extract 8 and answer question 15. Extract 8. Did the school give you a list of what you'll need for the camping trip? Yes, they did. Got it here somewhere. OK, read it out then. Two pairs of old sports shoes. One woolen pullover. OK, you've got that. Um, one sleeping bag. One foam mattress. No blow-up mattresses allowed as they don't fit in the tent. Right. Six pairs of socks. Six? Yes. <laughs> and gloves too? No. Gloves aren't on the list. And what about a torch for finding your way around in the dark? Yes. Flashlight is mentioned and spare batteries too. Listen to extracts 9 and 10 and answer the questions. Extract 9. The new education building on campus is known as an intelligent building. That means that the lifts are supposed to know if you are waiting for them and the lights should go off automatically if there's no one in the rooms. But in fact, the lights often go off in the middle of lectures and you have to get up and wave your arms around to turn them on again. And in the summer, the air conditioning is so cold, you often need to wear a coat. I don't think that's very intelligent, do you? Extract 10. Over the past 150 years, bicycles have undergone an enormous number of changes. In fact, the bicycle is now a mature product. So much so that any dramatic advances are no longer likely. However, there are still exciting times ahead for the bike. Concerns about pollution, health and traffic congestion, as well as fashion and new construction materials, are highlighting the role of the bicycle in our everyday lives. And for many people, especially over short distances of less than eight kilometers, using a bike can often be much faster than driving a car. Test one. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the real test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to Test 1, Section 1, on page 30. Test 1, Section 1. A woman wants to find out about a paragliding course. Listen to the conversation between the woman and the man and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played twice. Hello, Paragliders Paradise. How can I help you? Oh, hi. I'm interested in doing a course in paragliding. Which course are you interested in? Well, I'm not sure. What's available? Well, we've got the introductory course which lasts for two days. 
Okay. Or there's the four-day beginner's course, which is what most people do first. I tend to recommend that one. And there's also the elementary pilot course, which takes five to six days, depending on conditions. We might try the beginner's course. The woman says they would like to try the beginner's course. So the answer is B, the four-day beginner's course. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to seven. Hello, Paragliders Paradise. How can I help you? Oh, hi. I'm interested in doing a course in paragliding. Which course are you interested in? Well, I'm not sure. What's available? Well, we've got the introductory course which lasts for two days. OK. Or there's the four-day beginner's course, which is what most people do first. I tend to recommend that one. And there's also the elementary pilot course, which takes five to six days, depending on conditions. We might try the beginner's course. What sort of prices are we looking at? The introductory is $190. The beginner's course, which is probably what you'd be looking at, is $320. No, sorry, $330. It's just gone up. And the pilot course is $430. Right. And you also have to become a member of our club so that you're insured. That'll cost you $12 a day. Everyone has to take out insurance, you see. Does that cover me if I break a leg? No, I'm afraid not. It's only third party and covers you against damage to other people or their bl Cassette 1, side 2. Now turn to section 4 on page 35. Test 1, section 4. You will hear a lecturer talking about dust storms. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 36. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 36. In the last lecture, we looked at the adverse effects of desert dust on global climate. Today, we're going to examine more closely what causes dust storms and what other effects they can have. As you know, dust storms have always been a feature of desert climates, but what we want to focus on today is the extent to which human activity is causing them. And it's this trend that I want to look at, because it has wide-ranging implications. So, what are these human activities? Well, there are two main types that affect the wind erosion process, and thus the frequency of dust storms. There are activities that break up naturally wind-resistant surfaces, such as off-road vehicle use and construction. And there are those that remove protective vegetation cover from soils, for example, mainly farming and drainage. In many cases, the two effects occur simultaneously, which adds to the problem. Let's look at some real examples and see what I'm talking about. Perhaps the best known example of agricultural impact on desert dust is the creation of the USA's Dust Bowl in the 1930s. The dramatic rise in the number of dust storms during the latter part of that decade was the result of farmers mismanaging their land. In fact, choking dust storms became so commonplace that the decade became known as the Dirty Thirties. Researchers observed a similar but more prolonged increase in dustiness in West Africa between the 1960s and the 1980s, when the frequency of the storms rose to 80 a year and the dust was so thick that visibility was reduced to a thousand meters. 
This was a hazard to pilots and road users. In places like Arizona, the most dangerous dust clouds are those generated by dry thunderstorms. Here, this type of storm is so common that the problem inspired officials to develop an alert system to warn people of oncoming thunderstorms. When this dust is deposited, it causes all sorts of problems for machine operators. It can penetrate the smallest nooks and crannies and play havoc with the way things operate because most of the dust is made up of quartz, which is very hard. Another example. The concentration of dust originating from the Sahara has risen steadily since the mid-1960s. This increase in wind erosion has coincided with a prolonged drought which has gripped the Sahara's southern fringe. Drought is commonly associated with an increase in dust raising activity, but it's actually caused by low rainfall, which results in vegetation dying off. In the second part, the speaker talks about the drying up of the Aral Sea. Look at questions 37 to 40 and complete the flowchart. One of the foremost examples of modern human-induced environmental degradation is the drying up of the Aral Sea in Central Asia. Its ecological demise dates from the 1950s, when intensive irrigation began in the then Central Asian republics of the USSR. This produced a dramatic decline in the volume of water entering the sea from its two major tributaries. In 1960, the Aral Sea was the fourth largest lake in the world, but since that time it has lost two-thirds of its volume. Its surface area has halved, and its water level has dropped by more than 216 metres. A knock-on effect of this ecological disaster has been the release of significant new sources of wind-blown material as the water level has dropped. And the problems don't stop there. The salinity of the lake has increased so that it is now virtually the same as seawater. This means that the material that is blown from the dry bed of the Aral Sea is highly saline. Scientists believe it is adversely affecting crops around the sea because salts are toxic to plants. This shows that dust storms have numerous consequences beyond their effects on climate, both for the workings of environmental systems and for people living in dry lands. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. At the end of the real test, you will have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet. Test 2. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the real test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to test two, section one, on page fifty-two. Test two, section one. A man wants to find out about a language course. Listen to the conversation between the man and the woman and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four.
you will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played twice. Good morning, University Language Centre. How can I help you? I'm interested in doing a language course. I did Mandarin last year, and now I'd like to do Japanese. The man says he would like to do a Japanese course, so the answer is C. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good morning, University Language Centre. How can I help you? I'm interested in doing a language course. I did Mandarin last year, and now I'd like to do Japanese. Can you give me some information about what courses are available at your centre and when they start, that sort of thing? Yes, certainly. Well, we actually offer a number of courses in Japanese at different levels. Are you looking for full time or part time? Oh, I couldn't manage full time as I work every day. But evenings would be fine, and certainly preferable to weekends. Well, we don't offer courses at the weekend anyway. But let me run through your options. We have a twelve-week intensive course, three hours, three nights a week. That's our crash course, or an eight-month course, two nights a week. I think the crash course would suit me best, as I'll be leaving for Japan in six months' time. Are you a beginner? Not a complete beginner, no. Well, we offer the courses at three levels: beginners, lower intermediate, and upper intermediate. Though we don't always run them all. It depends very much on demand. I'd probably be at the lower intermediate level, as I did some Japanese at school, but that was ages ago. Right. Well, the next level two course begins on Monday, the twelfth of September. There are still some places on that one. Otherwise, you'd have to wait until January or March. No, I prefer the next course. The woman asks the man for some details about himself. Look at questions five to ten. Now listen to their conversation, and complete the form. Right. Can I get some details from you then, so I can send you some information? Sure. What's your name? A family name first. Haggerty. Richard. H a g a r t y.、Uh, no. H a g e r t y. Oh, okay. And your address, Richard. Well, perhaps you could email it to me. Right. What's your email address? It's Ricky forty、uh, five. That's one word. R I C K Y four five at hotmail dot com. And I just need some other information for our statistics. This helps us offer the best possible courses and draw up a profile of our students. Fine. What's your date of birth? I was born on the twenty ninth of February, nineteen eighty. Nineteen eighty. So you're a leap year baby. That's unusual. Yes, it is. And just one or two other questions for our market research, if you don't mind. No, that's fine. What are your main reasons for studying Japanese? Business, travel, or general interest? My company is sending me to Japan for two years. All right, I'll put down business. And do you have any specific needs? Will there be an emphasis on written language? For instance, will you need to know how to write business letters, that sort of thing? No, but I will need to be able to communicate with people on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Okay, so I'll put down conversation. Yes, because I already know something about the writing system at an elementary level, and I don't anticipate having to read too much. You said you'd studied some Japanese. Where did you study? Three years at school.、Uh, then I gave it up, so I've forgotten a fair bit. You know how it is with languages if you don't have the chance to use them. Yes, but I'm sure it will all come back to you once you get going again. Now, once we receive your enrolment form, we'll contact. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two on page fifty-four. Test two, section two. You will hear a man talking on the radio about dogs which help people with their work. First, look at questions eleven and twelve. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven and twelve. Welcome to this week's edition of Countrywide, and today we're taking a look at a number of different breeds of working dogs. And here to report on the dogs with jobs is Kevin Thornhill. Thanks, Joanne. Well, yes, dogs with jobs is the subject of today's program. Dogs have earned themselves a reputation over the centuries for being extremely loyal. And here's a little story which illustrates just how loyal they are. Just outside the country town of Gundagai in Australia is a statue built to commemorate a dog. A dog which sat waiting for his owner to return to the spot where he'd left him. Well, the story, which was immortalised in a song, has it that the poor dog died waiting for his master, five miles from Gundagai, which is where they built the statue. Now that's what I call loyalty. Now look at questions thirteen to twenty. As the talk continues, complete the table for questions thirteen to twenty. Well, because of their loyalty and also their ability to learn practical skills, dogs can be trained to do a number of very valuable jobs. Perhaps the most well-known of working dogs is the border collie sheepdog. Sheep dogs, which work in unison with their masters, need to be smart and obedient. With an IELTS practice tests plus. Cassette two, side one. Test three. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the real test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. 
Now turn to Test 3, Section 1, on page 72. Test 3, Section 1. A student wants to register for a conference. Listen to the conversation between the student and the woman and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played twice. Good morning. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes. Is this where we register for the Beyond 2000 conference? Yes. What's your name and I'll get your conference bag. The student says she wants to register for the Beyond 2000 conference. So you write the words, Beyond 2000. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Look at the registration form. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good morning. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes. Is this where we register for the Beyond 2000 conference? Yes. What's your name and I'll get your conference bag. Well, I haven't actually registered yet. I was told I'd be able to register today, so I hope that's okay. I've just arrived in Melbourne. That should be fine if you're a student. I'll need to take your details, though. So, can I have your full name? Yes, sure. It's Melanie Mitchell. Is that M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L? -L? Yes, that's right. And that's Ms, not Miss. OK, fair enough. And what's your address, Melanie? I live in student accommodation at Sydney University, so my address there is Room 66, Women's College, Newtown. OK. And which faculty are you studying in? I'm in the Faculty of Education. I'm doing a Master's in Primary School Teaching. Right. And may I see your student card, because I need to verify that you're a current student. Yes, sure. Here it is. My number is 994-578-ED. The woman asks the student some more questions about the conference. Look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and answer questions 5 to 10. OK. Now, do you want to attend all three days? The conference runs from Thursday to Saturday. Yes, I think so, if I can afford it. What does it cost? Well, you're eligible for a student discount, which makes it $15 for a day registration or $40 for the three days, though it is possible to register for half a day only. I'll register for all three days, please. Good. Now, will you be requiring accommodation while you're here in Melbourne? Yes, I suppose I will. What's available? Well, we have several levels of accommodation. You can share a room with another student for $25 a night. Hmm. Or you can have your own room but share the bathroom. I believe it's just down the corridor. That's $45. Right. Or you can have a single room with your own bathroom. I don't mind sharing a room. On second thoughts, yes, I do. I'll have my own room, but I'll share the bathroom. Right. Now, the conference fee does not include meals, though you do get tea and coffee in the breaks. Shall I put you down for lunch? That's an extra $10 a day. 
And there's the conference dinner on Friday night, which is $25. Oh, and what about breakfast? <laughs> Hang on a minute. It's all starting to sound rather expensive. Um, I'll have the lunch, but not the dinner or breakfast, if that's okay. Perfectly okay. Now, a couple of other things. There are a number of special interest groups organised. They're known as SIGs, and you're asked to nominate your preference. They'll take place on the Friday afternoon and Saturday morning, but they're filling up quickly, which is why you need to nominate now. Right. What are the SIGs? Well, there are six altogether. Let's see. On Friday, you have a choice between computers in education or teaching reading skills. Hmm. Or a session on catering for the gifted child. Oh, they all sound interesting. But technology in the classroom is really my area of interest, rather than reading. So I'll go for that. I can probably read up on the gifted child topic myself. Right. And then the Saturday options are a session on cultural differences, or there's music in the primary curriculum, or you could go to the one on gender issues in the classroom. Wow. Can I go to them all? They all sound fascinating. Afraid not. Well, I'm really interested in how boys and girls behave differently, even when they are very young, so I'd better opt for the third session, even though the cultural differences sig is probably really interesting too. Right. And the music option would be interesting. And how would you like to pay? We accept most credit cards or bank checks, but not personal checks, I'm afraid been caught out too often before. And cash, of course. We never say no to cash. I'll have to put it on my card because I don't have enough cash on me right now. That's fine. Enjoy your time here with us in Melbourne. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2 on page 73. Test 3, section 2. You will hear a woman talking about a number of different beaches to a group of tourists. First, look at questions 11 to 20. As you listen, answer questions 11 to 20. Right, let's move on to the beaches here, which are absolutely beautiful. You do have over a hundred to choose from. They're mostly sandy beaches, and they vary from the largest, which is two and a half kilometers long, to tiny sandy coves. But there are a few that I'd really recommend you to visit. So, looking at this pamphlet, first of all, there's Bandela Beach. This beach is one kilometer away from the old fishing village of Bandela, which is a beautiful spot. If you park in the car park behind it, there's a small path which leads down to the bay. It's very pretty because the whole beach is backed by pine trees, so it's very sheltered. The beach itself is very clean, and the water is shallow and safe. That, together with the soft sand, make it an ideal beach for children and non-swimmers. Um, a little further round the coast, again to the east, in the eastern corner of the island, is the spectacular Dapolata Beach, which is basically a long inlet. The land around this beach is marshland, 
It's all marsh, and there's a stream which winds through it, and the stream goes into the sea, and the beach has lovely pale gold sand. Access to this beach is quite tricky, and not for the less energetic. You have to go down a long flight of steps, 190 to be exact. But you'll be relieved to know that there's also a road which winds down to a car parking area. When you're level with the sea, there is a handful of shops and bars, and you can hire some beds and umbrellas. Continuing round the island, just past the tip of Calne, is the next beach I'd suggest you visit, and this is San Get. Why? Because there isn't a beach longer than this on the island. If you want to know, it's exactly two and a half kilometres long, and that's a bonus because it means it never gets overcrowded. It has golden sand and clear blue water shelving into the sea. There are several beach restaurants to choose from, and water sports are available when the water is calm. But check first. This beach operates a flag system, as the sea can get rough, and you should always swim between the flags. There's a large car park which gives you easy access to the eastern end of the beach, but the western end is much quieter and more wild, as it is harder to reach. Blanaka is another popular beach, just in the northwest corner of the island. It has incredibly white sand and sparkling water. There is ample car parking here and plenty of bars and restaurants. Blanaka has white cliffs all around it. And for those of you who'd like a little more to do than just lazing on the beach, there are caves here which you can explore in the cliffs, and you can also dive into the water from rock platforms along the side of the cove. Well, my final recommendation for today is Dissador. Now, this beach isn't quite as easy to get to as the others I've talked about. It's quite a remote little beach, tucked away here next to Blanaka. You can reach Dissador by a steep slope. Which goes over some sandbanks. The beach itself is small and pretty, with reddish-coloured sand and some stony areas on its eastern side. Despite being quite small, the bathing is good, and you can also go fishing here from the rocks at either side. It's a good idea to take some food and drink with you if you decide to go here, as there's only one little bar which isn't always open. So that should give you plenty of ideas to choose from over the next two weeks, and if you have any further questions, that is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three on page seventy-four. Test three, section three. In this section, you will hear a discussion between a male interviewer and a woman who is the manager of a major bookstore. First, look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen to their conversation, and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. The start of a new academic year is a challenge for booksellers. Lee Rogers talks to one major bookstore manager. Jenny Farrow, you're the manager of Dalton Books, and you sell an awful lot of books to students, don't you? Yes, we do. How do you manage to make sure that you're going to have the books students need when all the new courses begin? Basically, we make preparations long before they arrive. Like all other major book retailers, we have a database of information, and using that, we contact course conveners in May and ask them to send us their book lists. How many books are we talking about? For one course? Yes, as an example. 
An average course requires about 30 books. We ask lecturers to indicate whether a book is what we call essential reading. You know, the students simply have to get it. Or whether it's what they would term recommended reading. Or whether it's just a supplementary text that they tend to refer to as background reading. What about predicted bias? It's not a perfect system, unfortunately. If a lecturer tells us that he expects us to sell a hundred copies of a book, we know that we could actually sell anything from 50 to 150. That's why in practice, when it comes to ordering, it's a lot safer to go by the previous year's sales figures, if that's possible, of course, if we've sold the book before. We also build other factors into the equation, including the type of course that the books are for, the student's year group, and a measure of our own judgment. And these criteria make a fairly accurate guide? As accurate as we can be, yes. Look at questions 25 to 30. Listen carefully and answer questions 25 to 30. What about the publishers? Do they take an active role in promoting new books? Certainly. The academic and professional publishing market is worth about £700 million a year, so publishers go to some lengths to make sure their books are known. The standard procedure they use is to mail out catalogues to lecturers or colleges and universities. That's been the main form of promotion for years. Now, of course, they can also post details of new or revised works on websites. Some even go so far as writing individual letters to the appropriate lecturers in order to let them know what's coming up. The lecturers then contact you if they're interested? That's right. The publishers send us, the booksellers, inspection copies. Lecturers can then get a free copy and decide whether it's going to be suitable for their course. And how does it work with the students? What are they looking for and who helps them most? I think lecturers are best placed to understand the students' needs. Often the critical issue is what represents value for money for students. This is more important than price per se. Do students actually buy books before they start the course? Apparently a large proportion of students wait to see what they need. Students have a firm idea of what constitutes a good book, so they tend to give themselves time to look at all the options before making a choice. They tend to go for books that are clear and easy to use. Often, the texts that their lecturers recommend turn out to be too academic and remain here on our shelves. Well, that was Jenny Farrow. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4 on page 75. Test 3, section 4. You will hear Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator, giving advice on how to get your first job or commission as an artist. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35.
Cassette 2, side 2. Now turn to section 3 on page 94. Test 4, section 3. In this section, you will hear a discussion between three people in a university tutorial. In the first part of the discussion, they're talking about city traffic and the motor car. First, look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 21 to 24. We're very pleased to welcome Professor Isaac Nebworth to our tutorial group today. And he's come to share one of his pet passions with us, city traffic and our western dependence on the motor car. I believe questions are quite welcome throughout. Thank you. Well, I know you're all very familiar with the superhighway here in Melbourne, but do superhighways automatically lead to super wealth, as our politicians would have us believe? I think not. Can you give us an example of what you mean exactly? Sure. Well, by continuing to encourage this dependence on the motor car, we simply create more congestion and more urban sprawl. And you can see that here in Melbourne, right under your nose. Excuse me, I would just like to say that I feel the sprawl is part of the city. The freeways mean people can enjoy the benefits of living away from the centre on larger blocks with gardens, but still be able to drive back into the city centre for work or entertainment. Well, I'm not convinced that people want to do that. And is our money being well spent? It may be okay for you now, but come back to me in five years' time. Let's take City Link, for example, the new freeway here in Melbourne. Well, I use the freeway all the time. I think it's great. Ah, yes, but it cost $2 billion to build, and you could have gotten ten times the value by putting the money into public transport. If you give the automobile road space, it will fill that space, and you'll soon find you'll be crawling along your City Link. But surely you cannot simply blame the car. Some of the blame must rest with governments and city planners. Well, there is an argument, surely, that building good roads is actually beneficial because most new cars these days are highly efficient. They use far less petrol than in the past and emissions of dangerous gases are low. Old congested roads, on the other hand, encourage traffic to move slowly and it's the stationary cars that cause the pollution and smog, whereas good roads increase traffic speeds and thus the amount of time cars are actually on the roads. Well, this is the old argument put forward by the road lobby, but for me it's clear cut. Roads equal cars, which equal smog. Public transport is the way to go. In the second part of the discussion, the professor talks about public transport in different cities. Look at questions 25 to 30 first. As you listen to the discussion, complete the questions about public transport. Now, on that topic of public transport, I read somewhere recently that Australia isn't doing too badly in the challenge to increase the use of public transport. Better than America, granted. But by comparison with Canada, it's not so good. For instance, if you compare Toronto with the US metropolis of Detroit, only 160 kilometres away, in Detroit, only 1% of passenger travel is by public transport, whereas in Toronto it's 24%, which is considerably better than Sydney, which can only boast 16%. Well, I think it's encouraging that our least car-dependent city is actually our largest city. 16% of trips being taken on public transport in Sydney isn't too bad. 
But it's a long way behind Europe. Take both London and Paris, for instance, where 30% of all trips taken are on public transport. Well, they do both have an excellent underground system. And Frankfurt comes in higher still at 32%. I understand that they've been very successful in Copenhagen at ridding the city of the car. Can you tell us anything about that experiment? Yes, indeed. Copenhagen is a wonderful example of a city that has learned to live without the motor car. Back in the 1960s, they adopted a number of policies designed to draw people back into the city. For instance, they paid musicians and artists to perform in the streets. They also built cycle lanes, and now 30% of the inhabitants of Copenhagen use a bicycle to go to work. Sydney, by comparison, can only boast 1% of the population cycling to work. It could have something to do with all the hills. Then they banned cars from many parts of the city, and every year 3% of the city parking is removed. And by constantly reducing parking, they've created public spaces and clean air. Really? There are also freely available bicycles, which you can hire for practically nothing. And, of course, they have an excellent public transport system. Well, that's all very well for Copenhagen, but I'd just like to say that some cities are just too large for a decent public transport system to work well, particularly in areas with low population, because if there aren't many people using the service, then they don't schedule enough buses or trains for that route. I accept that there is a vicious circle here, but people do need to support the system. And secondly, the whole process takes so long because usually you have to change. You know, from bus to train, that sort of thing. And that can be quite difficult. Ultimately, it's much easier to jump in your car. And often, it turns out to be cheaper. Sure, but cheaper for whom? You or society? We have to work towards the ideal and not give in all the time because things are too difficult. Anyway, let's move on to some of the results of the survey, which I think you'll agree. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4 on page 96. Test 4, section 4. You will hear a lecturer talking about food preservation. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 37. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 37. In today's lecture, I'd like to look at the topic of food preservation and start by asking the obvious question, why do we need to preserve food? Well, apart from keeping it fresh for our daily needs, many foods such as fruit and vegetables are only available at certain times of the year. So. If we want to be able to eat these foods all year round, we need to preserve them. We also need to preserve food for export overseas to make sure that it doesn't perish in transit. And lastly, we need to be able to preserve food for when there are food shortages. There are a number of methods of preserving food which involve both high and low temperatures, chemicals, irradiation and drying. Let's have a look at these in turn. In the 1870s, the French scientist Louis Pasteur showed that microorganisms in food could be destroyed by raising the temperature of the food, a process now known as pasteurization. This involves heating milk to just 65 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. 
A new method, the ultra-high temperature, or UHT process, involves heating milk to 150 degrees Celsius for three seconds. The advantage of treating milk in this way is that it lasts much longer, though I tend to feel, and I'm sure many of you would agree, that taste is somewhat sacrificed in the UHT process. <laughs> <laughs> Tin cans were first used in the early 1800s to store and preserve food. Just as they are now, the cans were tin-plated steel containers, and the process had the advantage of being cost-effective. Unfortunately, however, there were many early cases of food poisoning, because the canning process was not fully understood at that stage. We now know the exact temperature and length of time each food needs for proper preservation, which has greatly reduced the risk of food poisoning. People living in cold climates often preserve food by burying it in the snow, and the Romans knew all about the advantages of packing food in ice. But for most people, this was not an option until the invention of the refrigerator in 1834. Today, however, refrigeration is the most important means of preserving food because the food stays fresh without needing to be treated. However, refrigeration requires an electricity supply, and unfortunately, if the power goes off, so does the food. <laughs> A variety of chemicals can be added to food, and you'll find their names listed on the labels of cans and bottles. Salt is probably the oldest of all the chemical preservatives, and was used by many ancient civilizations for many years. Sugar also acts as a preservative, and is used to preserve jams in much the same way that vinegar is used to pickle foods. Chemical preservatives are effective but they do not suit all foods, and the processes involved are time-consuming. Another method of preserving food is by drying it. Most foods are 75% to 90% water, so if you remove the water, the microorganisms simply can't survive. When food is dried, it not only lasts a long time, but it also becomes much lighter, which is a big advantage, as this makes it cheap to store. Though some people argue that valuable nutrients are lost in the process. In the second part, the speaker describes the process of drying food. Look at questions 38 to 40. Now listen carefully and label the diagram. Early methods for drying food involved cutting it into strips and hanging it in the sun or over fires. But there are now a number of more modern methods which involve the use of recent technology. One of these is known as roller drying, and it's a highly effective way of making dried foods from liquids, such as soup. Have a look at this diagram to see how it works. Well, first of all, the hot soup is poured in at one end here, the liquid spreads to form a thin layer on a heated belt. The liquid dries as it moves along. By the time it reaches the end of the belt, all the water has evaporated, leaving only dry powder. A blade then scrapes the dried material off the roller and captures it in powder form. All you have to do is add boiling water and you have your hot soup back again, ready to drink. Another method is called freeze drying and for those of you who still remember that is the end of section 4 you now have half a minute to check your answers That is the end of the listening test. At the end of the real test, you will have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet. Test 5. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. 
There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the real test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to test five, section one, on page 112. Test five, section one. A man wants to place an order by telephone for some office stationery. Listen to the conversation between the woman and the man and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played twice. Thank you for calling Millennium Office Supplies. If you would like to place an order, please press 1. Your call has been placed in a queue. A customer service operator will be with you shortly. Gina speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I'd like to order some stationery, please. And who am I speaking to? John Carter. The man says his name is John Carter. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Thank you for calling Millennium Office Supplies. If you would like to place an order, please press one. Your call has been placed in a queue. A customer service operator will be with you shortly. Gina speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I'd like to order some stationery, please. And who am I speaking to? John Carter. Right. Can I just confirm your account number and the name of your company, John? Sure. The account number is 692411. 692411. Right. And you're from Rainbow Computers? Uh, no. The company is Rainbow Communications. Oh, OK. I'll just fix that on the system. Communications. And what would you like to order, John? Uh, envelopes. We need a box of A4, that is, normal size envelopes. White, yellow or manila? Um, we'll have the plain white, please. Uh, but the ones with the little windows. OK. One box, A4, white. Just the one box, was it? Um, on second thoughts, make that two boxes. We go through heaps of envelopes. Um, as a matter of interest, are they made from recycled paper? No, you can't get white recycled paper. The recycled ones are grey, and they're more expensive, actually. Right, we'll stick to white, then. Something else, John? Yes, we need some coloured photocopy paper. What colours do you have? We've got purple, light blue, blue, light green, whatever you want, pretty much. There are 500 sheets to the pack. Right, let's see. Um, we're going to need a lot of blue paper for our new price lists, so can you give us ten packs, please? Make sure it's the light blue, though. Ten packs of the light blue. The woman asks the man if he needs anything else. Look at questions eight to ten.
Now listen to their conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Anything else that we can help you with? Um, uh, let me think. What else do we need? Uh, oh, I'm sure there was something else. Pens, paper clips, fax paper, computer supplies, office furniture. Yeah, ah, oh yes, we need floppy disks. Do you have those nice coloured ones? Yes, but they're a bit more expensive than the black ones. Oh, that's all right. I'm not paying anyway. <laughs> right. Floppy disks. And what about diaries for next year? We've got them in stock already, and it's a good idea to order early. Um, no, I think we're all right for diaries. But something we do need is one of those big wall calendars. You know, one that shows the whole year at a glance. Do you stock those? We certainly do. OK, can you include a wall calendar then, uh, with the other stuff? Um, just make sure it's got the whole year on 